Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Live with the Hagley Historian. I am Lucas Clawson, historian at Hagley Museum and Library here in Wilmington, Delaware. This is coming to you as part of our Hagley from Home initiative. Since Hagley Museum and Library is currently closed to staff and researchers, we are bringing Hagley to you from our home. So you are seeing this recording, or this uh, live broadcast rather, live from my home here in Wilmington, Delaware. Thank you all for joining me this morning. And I'll have you know that this is the 11th program in the series. This is the 10th from my home studio here in Wilmington. I know there's several of you who have uh, been with me from the beginning, and thank you for tuning in to all of these and uh, coming to hear about Hagley and the sorts of uh, history that we do and things that are in our collections. Uh, my production assistant, Lucian, he's happy that you're here too. He's uh, been here through uh, most of all of these and has become uh, just as much of a part of the program as all of the history has been. So uh, we're happy that uh, Lucian here is to sit over my shoulder and supervise what's going on. Today's program... DuPont and the Manhattan Project. This is a, a big project that I came across in uh, doing some research through the DuPont Company Atomic Energy Division records at Hagley. This is a pretty often asked for set of records, and they're absolutely fascinating because this documents all of DuPont's work in both atomic weapons and nuclear energy. And this is a huge topic that uh, we can uh, take on in uh, other talks and uh, other other things later on down the line, but today I'm going to talk to you about a really small portion of all this and what got DuPont into this whole business to begin with, which is the Manhattan Project during the Second World War. And another thing I'll point out to you is that uh, with all the records that are at Hagley, it's uh, a bit ironic that the best documented World War II site is the one we're going to talk about today, the Hanford Engineer Works out near Richland, Washington, and it was one of the most top secret, but yet it's the well, most well documented now. And it's a, kind of an accident of records, if you will, because as uh, time goes on, things that are routine, like the conventional ordnance plants, they go into a records retention schedule and out the door when they're no longer useful. But these records were specified by the U.S. government, the Atomic Energy Commission, and then later the Department of Energy that they get kept as things that are important, but also the top secret nature of all this. Another thing that I'm going to lay out for you today, too, is uh, one of the things that, that we're not talking about is the decision to drop an atomic bomb. That's not a, a path that I'm going to go down with this talk, in part because DuPont is not involved in all of this. DuPont's responsible for only one small slice of the Manhattan Project, and they were, were not part of the larger overall decision-making over whether or not a bomb should be dropped. Now, DuPont people got involved in the discussion after the war, about what do you do with atomic energy now that the cat's out of the bag, so to speak. So uh, that's one of the things that uh, we can come back and visit later, and then I can touch on a little bit further down the line. So without further ado, let's get into today's program, DuPont and the Manhattan Project. So I'm going to start in a place that you probably won't expect, but I'm going to set the stage a little bit for you and uh, explain a little bit about uh, what's going on in a larger context to, to help you get at why DuPont is so important in all this and what's going on in the national scene. So in the run-up to World War II, one of the big things DuPont threw out, and this is where we're going to start, is nylon. Nylon was introduced at the 1939 New York and San Francisco World's Fairs. This was a huge product for DuPont, a huge thing for them to put out. It was uh, developed in the experimental station right here in Wilmington. Quite a revolutionary thing that DuPont threw this out there. One of the more uh, popular uses for nylon was in ladies' stockings. So the photographs you're seeing are from the DuPont Pavilion at the 1939 New York World's Fair. So DuPont is known as a materials and a chemicals giant in the run-up to the World War II and everything that goes on with World War II. This is the direction that they're going, and not munitions or really even ordnance. This is something they get pulled into on account of World War II. But one of the things I want to help you understand is, is why push to even make an atomic bomb to begin with. And this is not something that DuPont is involved with directly, but the steps to the process are, are what DuPont ends up getting involved with a little further down the line. So concurrent with the introduction of nylon, you have a big problem in that nuclear fission, which is a chain reaction, meaning when an atom splits, it splits other atoms in chains, so on and so on, and causes either a nuclear explosion or in a controlled way can make energy. 
but the concept debuted in Germany in January, February 1939. So a lot of folks in Germany saw this as a tremendous threat because remember that Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party were in power taking over a lot of Europe in that point. You know, This is January, February, September 1939, World War II got rolling, Britain, France, and later the United States all get pulled in. But at that moment, a lot of people saw this as a threat, and uh, one of them being uh, Leo's Lazard and Albert Einstein. So they were people uh, who were, were scientists, physicists. They understood the importance of what was going on. But importantly, uh, people like Einstein were also Jewish. They knew what was going on in Germany and saw the tremendous threat that Germany posed by having this. So they wrote a letter to Franklin Roosevelt in October 1939 warning them of the problem, and this sets – the, the American research project in motion, that Franklin Roosevelt took this seriously enough to, to make it a priority of the United States government even before the U.S. got involved in the Second World War. So another thing to think of in all this is, is a nuclear fission, you know, what that really is. So again, this is a chain reaction. Whenever you split an atom, pieces fly off, and whenever the pieces hit other atoms, they make that atom split and so on and so forth. So uh, you can make a bomb. That's what makes this work, this chain reaction, that whenever it explodes, it sends it off into little pieces, and, it, and, and uncontrolled, it's a tremendous amount of energy released all at once. But controlling that is something that's an important thing, too. So the theoretical concept of being able to control a uranium chain reaction was devised in May 1940. So uranium is the, the element. It's considered a heavy metal that they use because it's got an extra piece, and that extra piece makes it so that you can knock it off and hit other uranium atoms. This is a, a uranium is an element that occurs naturally out in the world. You can uh, dig it up out west, places all over the world that you get it. So in May 1940, they came up with the concept of being able to theoretically control a uranium chain reaction. Keeping in mind that this is uh, when Germany is in the process of taking over Europe, Japan is making big incursions in the Pacific, but Germany is the really important part here because they're the ones who could potentially have this technology. So in July 1941, the National Academy of in Science, Sciences in the United States starts to investigate uranium fission in light of the war in Europe. They know that the, what's happening in Europe is stepping up in a big way, so they need to respond. So the National Academy of Sciences really pushes American physicists, scientists to think about this. An important part of this process is this fellow, Glenn Seaborg, out in California, who in February to March 1941 – came up with how you can make a new element called plutonium-239. And so plutonium does not occur naturally in the world. It's made by it's, – it's a byproduct, more or less, of decayed uranium. So you take uh, two isotopes of uranium, and one is used to make the other. So those pieces that get knocked off get absorbed into the other one, and as they decay, that's how you come up with plutonium-239. And that is an important part of this process because they realize if you can make this new element, plutonium, you can get a lot more bang for your buck, so to speak, in the chain reaction power, that it takes a lot less plutonium to generate the same amount of power as, uh, as you w uh, would need for uranium. So this is, a, again, a really important part of the process is that Glenn Seaborg came up with a process to make this new element, making plutonium out of uranium. So in November 1941, the Office of Scientific Research and Development, which the uh, government had created to think about things that are out there, technological, scientific things that are, that are out in the world that could potentially help the war effort. The United States has been thinking about what might happen if they get pulled into a war uh, starting in 1939-1940. And so they recommend expediting the program to develop fissionable uranium and plutonium. So the head of this program is this fellow, Vannevar Bush who was himself uh, quite an – he was an engineer and not a scientist, but he, that's part of why he was in charge of helping think this stuff through. And uh, we'll get to the concept of an engineering versus a scientific product a little further down the – or problem a little further down the line and thinking about how you deal with uranium and plutonium. But he recommends expediting this program and moving it along. So in December 1941, the U.S. government creates what they call the Metallurgical Project, at the University of Chicago, headed up by physicist Arthur H. Compton, he himself a Nobel laureate in, in physics. So the metallurgical project is the code name used to hide working on heavy metals, so plutonium and uranium. So uh, this was set up at the University of Chicago to do a lot of the theoretical research that's going to go into to figuring out how to 
use these elements, get them to the point where you can actually incorporate them into something usable for a bomb or uh, some kind of a, of a weapons source. So in June 1942, we get to a scientific or an engineering problem. So a lot of the science on this is getting pretty well established. The next step is how do you make something out of it? You know, now that you've got a scientific concept in mind, you need to be able to put it into production somehow. So how do you do that? And that's where the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers gets involved. They're assigned the responsibility for atomic research and development, including uranium and plutonium, because the government feels at this point you can kick it over with scientific help to make an engineering problem out of it. You know, how do, again, do you go through the process of setting up a production facility to make this stuff and make the machinery in order to turn this into something usable? The Manhattan District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is created to handle the work under the command of General Leslie Groves. So the Manhattan District Army Corps of Engineers is, is more or less just a place to hide this project. It's not really uh, has anything to do with specifically New York or any kind of significance. It's just a way, again, to, to code name all this, but create an official group within the Army Corps of Engineers to handle it. Leslie Groves, in part, got pulled into this because he had just finished working as the military liaison on the Pentagon building and some other major construction projects. Up to this point, he had also been working on conventional ordnance plants and uh, working with companies like DuPont. One of Leslie Groves' uh, big things was to bring people who he trusted, people who worked well under the fold. So one of the first people he picked to be part of the Manhattan Project was this fellow, Lieutenant Colonel Frank Franklin T. Mathias, who was a civil engineer. And uh, he was part of the building of the Pentagon building and some of the conventional ordnance plants, uh, but was someone who Leslie Groves trusted explicitly. So he's an important person that gets pulled into the Manhattan Project from the military end. So Leslie Groves had learned through all of his engineering projects up to this point that you really need trustworthy contractors to work on projects, that if you have people that, that don't know what they're doing, they, that can't take on the full extent of the thing you need them to do, then the project is probably going to be doomed to failure. So uh, all of his experience up to that point is what feeds into how he ends up dealing with the Manhattan Project, and that's why he wanted to get the DuPont Company involved in some way because they were a known commodity to him, that they were a proven engineering company, a proven chemical company and chemical engineering company. So it's not really got anything to do with DuPont making things that blow up that put them on the radar, so to speak, for the Manhattan Project. Again, it's about engineering, that DuPont had the capacity to do research and development, to build their own stuff, to run their own programs, run their own factories. And so that's why Leslie Groves starts pushing for this to, to get DuPont involved. So it's important to, to point out to you all that uh, in World War II, DuPont was the largest supplier of propellants and explosives to the U.S. military, but their larger role even was the production of materials, things like paints, cloth, nylon. So nylon immediately in World War II got turned over to military uses, so a lot of ladies were unhappy they couldn't get nylon stockings during the war because it was used for things like tow ropes, uh, for gliders, for parachutes, all sorts of, of applications. DuPont also made materials like lubricants, coolants, chemicals, all sorts of stuff, you know, that this was a, a role that they had already taken on in the run-up to World War II, and then once World War II got going in December 1941, that's where they landed. But, again, Leslie Groves wanted to get them involved somehow. So step by step, DuPont started getting involved with the Manhattan Project. So in August of 1942, they started lending chemical engineers to the metallurgical project, people that could help figure out how to chemically remove one element from another or use chemicals to separate things out, refine things down in a certain way. And then by 1942, October 1942, they were providing engineering assistance to design a plutonium production plant. So as the engineering problem moves further down the line, you want to make a factory more or less to make this plutonium. So DuPont gets involved in some of the early stages of figuring out how to make that work. But again, Groves wanted one contractor for the plutonium project. He didn't want several, so he wanted DuPont. In November 1942, he traveled to Wilmington, Delaware, and met with Walter Carpenter, who was at that point the DuPont Company president, and briefed him on the Manhattan Project, or at least the parts he wanted him to know. 
and what he wanted DuPont to do and how he wanted DuPont to get involved. There was a bit of skepticism, though. The DuPont board, whenever Walter Carpenter took this back to the DuPont board, they were reluctant to even get involved. And this is for a lot of reasons, because this is all theoretical up to this point. Remember, this is early days for the nuclear project that uh, part of the concerns of the DuPont board were uh, if you start splitting atoms, what's going to happen? So if you have an uncontrolled chain reaction, which is what they're proposing for an atomic weapon, is it going to just blow up a city or is it going to tear the universe in half? You don't know. And also safety protocols. That one of the big tenets of the DuPont company from its beginning in 1802 all the way up through the 1940s was to do things safely. So how do you deal with this new incredibly dangerous radioactive thing in a safe way that they felt like the liability and all that was just not something at that point they were prepared to take on. So the board chewed it over and, and were not convinced. Pushed this back to Leslie Groves. A lot of negotiations were involved in all this. DuPont relented, and on December 21, 1942, they agreed to take on the Manhattan Project, taking the work that they wanted them to do for the Manhattan Project. But there were a couple of stipulations that went along with it. One is that this would be what was called a cost plus one dollar contract, that uh, just before World War II, DuPont had been accused of profiteering off of World War I through the Anai Committee he hearings in the uh, mid-1930s, and took an absolute public relations bloodbath over that. So they insisted on any work for the government being a cost plus one dollar contract, and that meant that it, all of the contracts, DuPont would get paid exactly what it cost to build, operate, maintain the thing that they were into doing and only get one dollar profit on top of it. And also specifically with the Manhattan Project, DuPont was to have no liability if something went wrong. So if you did split an atom in an uncontrolled way and the universe got torn in half, you couldn't come back and sue DuPont for that. So that was part of, of the negotiations that went on and how DuPont agreed to take on the project. So their responsibility in all this is specific, but it's pretty revolutionary that they were to use newly created scientific concepts to develop an industrial scale production process, meaning that you're manufacturing a new element. So this is one of the revolutionary parts of all this, is that their job was to take this research and make something that no one had ever made before and make it on an industrial level. So not just make a little bit of it, make a lot of it potentially. So how do you do that? How do you scale it up? That's their, that's their responsibility in all this. And so they created what they called the TNX department under the Explosions, Explosives Division to carry out the work. And this was a, a clever little nod to uh, World War I. So uh, if, if any of you saw the uh, previous talk on DuPont in World War I, that the TNX was an experimental explosive that DuPont came up with for the United States Navy to use in depth charges and sea mines. So this was, a, I think, kind of a clever way to hide that in their own paper keeping was to call it the TNX department under the Explosives Division. So DuPont named this fellow, Crawford H. Greenwald, to be the liaison among DuPont, the Metallurgical Project at the University of Chicago, and the Manhattan District Corps of Engineers. That uh, Crawford Greenwald is a pretty important person in all this because, again, he's the go-between among all these different entities. So he's going to the Metallurgical Project, figuring out what they've got going on, taking the ideas back to DuPont, to their research and development section, he uh, takes that in turn back to the Metallurgical Project, making all of his reports to the Corps of Engineers. So DuPont's the one who's sort of setting some of the design concepts in all this. And so his importance in all this, too, is that Crawford Greenwald is an engineer. So he's thinking about this as an engineering problem. So the way he approached it and the way the DuPont company approached it is that the government sets out a timeline. We want to have an atomic weapon by this date, so let's work backwards. We've got to have factories in place by this date. Then we've got to have the design choices completed by this date. We've got to have all of our ducks in a row for construction at this date. So you make a timeline working backwards. This is something that the DuPont company excelled at, and one of the things that Crawford Greenwald excelled at. So that's why he gets pulled into this in, in a lead capacity. He's also present for the first sustained nuclear controlled chain reaction at the University of Chicago on December 2nd, 1942. The image you're seeing is from his notebook. So one of our sets of records at Hagley is Crawford Greenwald's engineering notebooks as he went through the process of the Manhattan Project from the very beginning all the way up through late 1944 once the uh, DuPont's plutonium production process really got underway. 
So this is an incredible set of documents. If you look closely, you'll see that it's stamped secret at the top. These were only declassified in 1988 and 89, and much of them are still redacted. But fortunately for us historians, a lot of his impressions of what he saw are recorded in these notebooks. So this are the pages where he recorded being present for the first nuclear chain reaction. So it's a pretty neat set of records to, to get into whenever uh, one is at Hagley and can take a look at them. So in taking over the Manhattan Project, a site had already been established at Oak Ridge in Tennessee. So the uh, U.S. government had already set up a laboratory there. Uh, it was called the Clinton Engineer Works, later the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which is what it is still known as. The uh, thing to keep in mind with all this is that it's in the southern Appalachian Mountains. It's not too far from Knoxville, Tennessee. Chattanooga, Tennessee, Asheville, North Carolina, you're also not far from a lot of main roads and big population centers. So immediately this was a matter of concern for DuPont. They knew that they didn't want to set up a full-scale production facility at Oak Ridge because what if something goes wrong? You have the potential to blow a lot of people up and, and things bad things happen. So the safety issue kicks in in a big way in all this. Uh, also, it's a security issue because being close to major roads, being close to major cities, uh, being in that part of the world, you're not far from a lot of things. So keeping what you're doing under wraps is a lot harder if you've got a large production facility set out. But the Clinton Engineer Works are pretty important because this is the learning lab for plutonium production. So this is where DuPont set up the X-10 graphite reactor. Uh, this was the uh, one of the first operational reactors uh, to help them figure out, you know, how do we make plutonium? How do we, we do all of this? And so uh, a thing to point out at this uh, juncture is that uh, with when we're talking about a nuclear reactor, most of us today are familiar with uh, energy production reactors. You know, these reactors uh, that the DuPont built in World War II were not set up for that purpose. They, these were just large machines that only made plutonium. So you take uranium and make plutonium out of it, and they're not meant to generate energy, that that's something that comes a little bit later uh, after World War II is done. But by September 1943, DuPont has this up in operation. The images you're seeing, the one it left, is the, what's called the face of the reactor. So uh, this is uh, where they're loading in the uranium, pushing it through the machine. Yeah, the image you right is the building that it was housed in at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So this is all going on. DuPont has to think of where are we going to put a full-scale production plant? You know, we need several things. So what are we going to do? In conjunction with Franklin Mathias, Lieutenant Colonel Franklin Mathias with the Corps of Engineers, DuPont set out to figure out, evaluate sites. Where can we put this thing so that we can have security, we can have ready access to power, access to a lot of water, roads, things that we need to run an operation like this. And the site they chose was in Washington State. And the, uh, the flag that you see, uh, it reads B Reactor if you look close, that is where the U.S. government and DuPont agreed would be the best place to put the Hanford, what they would call the Hanford Engineer Works. This was called the Hanford site. So in January 1943, the government started the process of purchasing the property necessary, and DuPont started making the arrangements to get everything there they needed to do to start building this plant. So it had, again, everything they needed. First and foremost, it's just to the right of the middle of nowhere. I mean, there's not a heck of a lot out there. It's got ready access to power because there's a, an electric grid that ran through the area. It's uh, right on the Columbia River, so you have plenty of access to water. You have road access. You can get people in and out. You can get stuff in and out. So this was, again, a really important part of this, this whole process is figuring out where they're going to put it. That way they could have security, but then also be able to set up a, a top-secret site making something incredibly dangerous. The site itself was located on a piece of high desert. So where you see the flag is, is where a, a bit of the production facilities ended up getting set up. The uh, town of Richland, which is all the, way, all the way down at the bottom, was pretty important to all this too because they needed a city nearby. That way they can get in goods and services and a lot of the things they needed. There's also a railhead there. That way they can move people and heavy equipment in and out. So this kind of gives you an idea of, of the site and, and what was needed. So in March 1943, DuPont's engineering department started construction of the site. The first thing that they had to build were houses. You're out in the middle of nowhere. You need to get people there. So they built a tremendous camp of uh, barracks, uh, roads, water sources, everything that you would need. It's a small city within itself. 
in addition to starting to lay the foundations for what would become the plutonium production facility. And so DuPont ended up building 554 plant buildings and 4,304 houses on the site. It's incredible. And to give you an idea of the extent, I'm going to show you a quick film clip that DuPont put together that uh, shows off some of the things at Hanford that they put in things like churches, schools, grocery stores because people have to eat. You have to have a post office to get mail in and out for the people who are living there. A bank, that way people can cash their paychecks, put their money in. An auditorium for shows, entertainment, theaters, movie theaters. Of course with Hanford on the front, Hutments. Barracks, the water filtration facility and sanitization facility. Got to get rid of waste. There's a complete sewage plant ended up getting built at Hanford. The process laboratory, which is the production facility, kind of a code name for it. You need hospitals on the site for all the people who are living there the administration building to run all of your operations. And there it is, big as life and twice as natural, so to speak, the Hanford Engineer Works. So it's quite an engineering undertaking. And to give you a sense that at its height while they're building this, there were 51,000 people that DuPont employed during the height of construction. So there's that many people who are on site. This is not how many people who ended up there during operations. So what you're seeing is a chart that DuPont put together to show between April 1943 and November 1944 how many people were on site at the Hanford Engineer Works. So this includes people that worked for DuPont as chemists, engineers, scientists, people who ran the plutonium production facility, but also people who were construction folks, laborers, uh, people who uh, worked there in the cafeterias, fire departments, everything that you needed to keep a site like that safe. So 51,000 people, just think about how many people you're cramming into the small space, and that's why you need essentially a city to go along with it. So when the plant was in operation, there were 15,000 people who were on site, and you needed 6,000 to operate the manufacturing machinery. So the balance of those folks are, again, the police department, administrative folks, all the other people who were involved in keeping a site like this in operation. So what you're seeing in the photographs, the one it left, is uh, people lining up on payday. These are uh, some of the folks who are working in the engineering department lining up. And at right, how DuPont helped solve the problem of paying that many people at once was to put a pay wagon in a, the back of a truck so you can drive it out to where the employees are. They can step up based upon their employee badge numbers and get paid. So it's quite a process, and DuPont was responsible for figuring all of this out. So it's not just the little element of making plutonium that's involved with something like the Hanford Engineer Works. It's about figuring out how to, to keep people there, keep them fed, keep it clean, keep everything in operation. So again, this is quite an undertaking. One of the things DuPont put together were uh, promotional materials. This is called Here's Hanford, which uh, gave you uh, tips for how to uh, properly dress for work whenever you're out and about on the property gave you a map of some of the communities that were there. That way you knew how to get around, where to go. They also put together booklets like this one made specifically for men called Highlights of Hanford. And uh, it shows uh, photographs of the inside of the barracks and the huts that they were in. And uh, the two pages I put up, the, uh, the heading for the one in the middle is called Is the Food Good? which tells you about the cafeteria spaces that are around. And the one at right is, you know, what recreations are there? So DuPont set up, again, theaters, bowling alleys, all sorts of stuff to, um, to keep people happy while they're there because they're sequestered in the site in the middle of nowhere. DuPont put the same thing together for women. This one is called Dear Anne, a letter telling you all about life at Hanford. So it's set up as a letter to Anne from Ruth about all the things that a woman will encounter when she goes to Hanford. And so uh, the, the section at the center is called What Shall I Wear, telling you about what you should wear to work, you know, proper clothing and attire for that, and telling them about the importance of the war job that they have. So uh, another thing that DuPont put together 
was a film to uh, help women understand what it was that they were getting into at the Hanford Engineer Works, and I'll show you a clip from this. Showing that a typical Hanford girl's day begins at 6 a.m. And I love this, that it walks you through these ladies' day. So getting up, getting themselves ready in the morning. And part of the idea with all this, again, DuPont came up with this film as well, was that their PR arm was pretty incredible by this point. This was in response to the Nye Committee, so they knew really well by 1943-44 how to make these films. So showing that these ladies can live, have a pretty good life out in the middle of nowhere working on this plant, that you're going to eat well. You go to these cafeterias, you're going to have coffee, you're going to have soup, all of the good food that you could possibly want, including cornbread. And about clocking in, showing her going to work. Showing off one of the jobs that some of these ladies do. This particular one is a cashier. that you can, for lunch, have a classy meal at one of the sandwich bars DuPont set up. And that at 5.30, your day's over. So then what do you do? She can stay in a room or go to some of the entertainments, like a classy band and a dance. And then when your day is done, back to your dormitory. Provided with everything that you need. And then off to a good night's sleep to get ready for the next day's work. So the film that this comes from is called uh, War Construction in the Desert, and we're pretty lucky to have it, and it's all in color because it shows a lot of aspects of Hanford, but one of the things that it's meant to really show off is the life of employees. It shows you that you're going to have everything you need, that you shouldn't feel bad in the least about going to a place like the Hanford Engineer Works to work because you're going to have all this stuff, that you can indeed have a nice life even though you're, you're working on this top secret project out in the middle of the desert. One of the ways that uh, DuPont kept their employees engaged was through a company newspaper. The, the one they put out was called the Sage Sentinel, which uh, gives you all sorts of uh, rundowns of what's happening at Hanford, people who were there, employee highlights. We at Hagley have every edition of the Sage Sentinel and have scanned it and put it up on our digital archives, should any of you uh, care to peruse it. But it's a fantastic document about what happened at Hanford and about how much of a, of a process it was to set all of this up and keep this factory going out in the desert. And one of the things to keep in mind, DuPont, rolling with safety, they held huge safety rallies. So this is one from uh, July 24th to 29th, 1944, uh, where they would get people together, tell them about safety. They would even crown safety queens. Uh, from the uh, DuPont employees. The very first one was a member of the Women's Army Corps, so that was a bit of a PR coup for DuPont to not only show that, a, um, that they could have someone to be head of safety, but a member of the military too. So again, lots of stuff going on here at Hanford Engineer Works. So now we get down to the problems of, of actually making plutonium. One of the things to point out to you is that this is an incredibly time- energy labor consuming process. So what you're seeing is the face of what's called the B reactor. This was the first operational reactor at Hanford. The thing is absolutely huge. So the photograph that left is of the face of the reactor in 1944 and the photographic right is of it uh, recently that you can now go to the Hanford Engineer Works and take a tour of this. But to give you a sense of scale, you can see the people standing in front of it. So how you make plutonium is that you take uranium and make what they call a slug. So it's a, a piece of uranium encased in aluminum. It's about the size of a 12 ounce soda can. And the face of this reactor is a bunch of tubes that go completely through this machine. And how it works is you put the 
slugs in one end and you slowly push them through the machine. So as you turn the machine on, the uh, pieces knock other pieces off, it bombards the uranium that's inside. So as it gets pushed through the machine and everything does its work, it gets the, f the fuel uranium and then like the receptor uranium ready to be turned into plutonium. So as it pushes it through, when it gets to the other side, that means it's cooked enough, so to speak, and it's done. It falls out into a 20-foot deep pool of water. It's so radioactive at that point, you can't handle it for one month. So DuPont's got to figure out, how do you make a machine that does that? You can't just have somebody with their finger pushing these things through because of how highly deadly this can be, how radioactive it is, how absolutely controlled it all has to be. So they have to come up with automation processes. So machines that can push all this stuff through, machines that can automatically grab the slugs on the other side, Whenever you're operating it, you have to be able to turn it on and off, so to be able to do that remotely from outside of the building. And also remote sensing technologies. How do you know the temperature inside of this thing when you can't just go and put a thermometer in? And how do you see inside? So remote video technologies, this was something they had to come up with as well. So this pulls in all parts of the DuPont company, and one of the reasons why DuPont got involved in this is that they could spread out bits and pieces throughout the United States, literally, to, to their company. So you have uh, places like Carney's Point, the Chambers Works over in New Jersey that are working on your, uh, a little piece figuring out where you're finding, you're finding uranium. The machine shops on the Christina River here in Wilmington, Delaware, are working on some of the remote sensing technologies. The Experimental Station works on it. Plants in West Virginia are working on a piece. It's spread out all over the place so that nobody really knows what's going on. That in operation in all this, there were only about 10 people at DuPont that knew the full scale of what was going on. And even then, most of them didn't know the bigger scale of the Manhattan Project. They only knew the one piece that DuPont was involved with, which was making plutonium. So you, you make this thing. You've also got to come up with your procedures to go along with it. So the item you see shown is the manual for B reactor. So this is the operator's manual. How do you run this thing? So DuPont had to create all this on the fly. They had to figure it out. So this was part of the process of setting up the Hanford Engineering Works. You know, they've got to come up again with every piece of this process. So a, a big problem with all of this is that whenever you get the slugs out of the back end of the machine, you've got to get the plutonium out. So the building that you're seeing, they called them the Queen Marys because they were over 800 feet long. These things were huge and had 15-foot uh, thick concrete walls. So how you get the plutonium out is that you take the slug of uranium encased in aluminum, dissolve it in chemicals, put it in a centrifuge, and it spins all the pieces out because plutonium is going to be the heaviest thing. It pulls the furthest away. All the rest of the stuff is in the center, so you can get it out that way. As you can imagine, this is a really dangerous piece of the process, and it's highly toxic. Every piece of machinery within the Queen Mary's were operated remotely. There was not a person that was going to be inside that building at any point. You could run all of it from the outside. So a problem with this, too, again, is getting down to scale. So for all of the process that goes, this stuff goes through, all of the energy you put into it, for pounds of uranium that you put in, you get grams of plutonium out. So this is a really inefficient process. And because of what you have to do to get the uranium and plutonium separated, it leaves a lot of byproducts. So what do you do with them? And one of the design choices that DuPont got into with this is that they said, okay, we need to have a materials done by a certain point. So what we're going to do is make some least worst choices. So we know that there are probably better ways, but we've got a deadline to meet. We'll come back and fix some of the problems later. So a lot of the storage facilities maybe weren't the best, but they were perfect at the time for what they needed them to do, which is not an apology for how things were done. It was more just to help you understand the pressures that the company was under to get all this done and get it done on a time stream. So this is a five to six month process. So this is not something that happens quickly. That uh, when you put the slugs into the reactor, it takes you at least a month to go through, then another 20 days or to a month, more or less, sitting in the pool to cool down enough to be able to get it out, then the rest of that down the line. So you can imagine the lead time you need to be able to make the plutonium, enough plutonium to, to be able to put into a bomb. And you need pounds of the stuff whenever you're only getting it grams at a time. You can imagine the problem. So this is a lot of production to get a very little bit of material out. Don't forget, too, that this is a military site. So DuPont ran it, but the military, the U.S. Army, are the ones who actually operated it. So uh, 
careful oversight was in place at all times. So Franklin Mathias, who ended up becoming the commanding officer at the Hanford Engineer Works, uh, ran the military detachment that was there. And there were frequent visits from people like Leslie Groves, uh, from Vannevar Bush, who was the head of the OSRD, and James Conant, who was one of the leading civilian government officials involved in making sure all of this happened. So it's a pretty brilliant, too, in some cases, because one of the ways they can hide this in plain sight is to have a strong military presence and make it look like just a regular old ordnance plant that a lot of people who worked there thought that's what they were doing. So um, not many people that were at Hanford knew exactly what they were doing. They knew they were making some type of explosive, but they didn't know what. So I want to show you one last film clip that shows the Army detachments at Hanford well, after we get uh, these ladies to sleep. That again, don't forget this was a military installation, so you had military police, military checkpoints, but then also a full guard staff. These guys had uh, machine guns, armored cars, everything they needed to protect the Hanford Engineering Works. Plus you had air bases nearby to provide air cover and keep unwanted aircraft from coming in. But these guys were set up so that they could deploy at any second to keep anybody out of this plant who happened to be there. But then also the Women's Army Corps were there. So this is a really neat thing that I'm glad that we have in our collections is this color film of the Women's Army Corps at the Hanford Engineer Works that they worked in the military administration in handling a lot of the correspondence between the government and Hanford Engineer Works and liaison work with DuPont. So that's specifically their role in all of this was to do administrative work for the Hanford Engineer Works, that these uh, ladies were members of the Army Corps of Engineers. So they were sent out through the Army Corps of Engineers to Hanford. The plutonium that was made at Hanford was pretty important. It was used in the Trinity test in New Mexico on July 16, 1945. So this was the first detonation of an atomic bomb in the world, the, the Trinity test. So that was made with DuPont plutonium. And the bomb that got dropped on Nagasaki, Japan on August 9, 1945 was plutonium made by the Hanford Engineering Works. The Hiroshima bomb was uranium. So remember that it takes so long to make plutonium, there wasn't enough to make a bomb to, for the one that got dropped on Hiroshima, so that ended up being a uranium bomb. So that's something to keep in mind in all this, that uh, this is something that DuPont played a large role in. And back to a point that I made earlier, DuPont's again not involved in the choice to drop a bomb, where to drop a bomb, any of the politics of that. The Manhattan Project is broken up into a lot of pieces. The Los Alamos Laboratory were the ones who were making the bomb. DuPont just provided the materials. Other groups figured out how to make the bomb drop from a plane. Lots of moving parts involved in the Manhattan Project. So with DuPont, whenever they made the plutonium, they handed it over to the Army Detachment on site. So DuPont gave it up at that point. The Army Detachment would take it somewhere, hand it off to another courier. They, in turn, would take it to Los Alamos or wherever it was going to be turned into a bomb. So this is something that DuPont is pretty far removed from, that again, not many people at DuPont knew exactly what it was they were doing until after the Nagasaki bomb was dropped on Japan in August 1945. So after that was done, in the late August, Walter Carpenter, president of DuPont, acknowledged the role that DuPont played. So this is a letter that was sent out to employees, and uh, there was another letter that was sent out to shareholders saying, here's what we did, here's what we participated in that we were part of the Manhattan Project, that we were an important war industry, that we did what the government asked us to make this war come to a close. And that's how they were framing it up. And that's how a lot of people who worked for the company framed it up too, although there were a lot of people who were pretty upset by this, that they were not happy about the fact that they worked on something that annihilated a city in Japan and created this whole new thing. So uh, this is a, a, a big problem for a lot of uh, people in the United States, but also people within the company. The company itself received an Army-Navy E award for high achievement for the Hanford Engineer Works because they produced everything on time and on schedule that they did, again, everything the government asked for them in the entire process. So remember back to the uh, cost plus one dollar contract the government, in the end, only paid them 68 cents of the dollar because they finished the contract in nine months rather than one year, which is what they were supposed to do. Uh, so government bureaucracy being that, they only, again, got paid the 68 cents on the dollar. 
The letter you're seeing is from the uh, Pasco Washington Kiwanis Club, where all the members got together and wrote a check for the balance and sent it to the DuPont Company, uh, but, which is a pretty interesting little piece to have in the collection, too. This is not the original letter. We don't have the original, but we do at least have this copy to uh, show that that was done and to kind of get into a, a little humorous uh, sideline of something that happened at a plant like this. So remember that DuPont was not really keen to be involved with the Manhattan Project to begin with, and one of their stipulations of taking it on was that whenever the war was done, they wanted out. So they originally wanted out of the Hanford Engineer Works in 1946. The government persuaded them to stay with Hanford until 1948. And at that point, uh, DuPont handed over operation to General Electric, and they operated it from that point on. The uh, plant ceased operations in 1987, but today it's de designated the Department of Energy major cleanup site. It's considered one of the most uh, toxic and polluted places in the world because of what was done there. A lot of the American nuclear arsenal, the fissile materials that went into the nuclear arsenal, got made at the Hanford Engineer Works. Um, so from 1989 to now, it's been a major cleanup site. It still is a major cleanup site, one of the problems being that the tanks that some of the byproducts were stored in were starting to break down, and they're worried that these materials would leach into the Columbia River, get out into local orchards, get out into the environment. So this is a, a problem that DuPont did think about while they were on site, uh, but because they handed it off, part of the reason why they wanted to hand it off is that uh, they, they knew that this could be a problem down the line. Uh, but that's not the main reason they wanted out of this. So don't think that, um, and again, I'm not an apologist for DuPont. The thinking that went into this at the time was that uh, the company wanted to get back to doing things on the civilian market. That was the primary concern in all this. And they realized that with dealing with plutonium, that it was something that would be incredibly difficult for them to make any money at doing. So got out of operations in 1948, but the site lived on. DuPont, though, did get pulled back into nuclear research and development in 1950. So they created what was called the Savannah River site that uh, is located near Augusta, Georgia. It's uh, in, uh, <clears throat> right, on the, right on the Savannah River in, in Augusta, Georgia. So it uh, was a major spot where DuPont got back in during the Cold War. They were asked during the Korean War to get back involved with making plutonium. So they set up the site there and operated it until 1989. Uh, DuPont uh, had a major presence in uh, Aiken, South Carolina, Augusta, Georgia, in operating this plant, and took a lot of what they learned at Hanford and applied it there. So all the safety protocols, how to run reactors, a lot of the, again, the things that they had figured out are what got applied to how they operated the Savannah Riverside. So where I want to wrap things up for you today, bringing this back around full circle to nylon, we're going to... Uh, end with a quote from, from Crawford Greenwald that uh, during the Manhattan Project, one of the government officials asked, asked him directly, I bet you guys are looking forward to the war being over with and really making a lot of money off of this atomic nuclear energy thing. And Greenwald's response was, no, we are going to go into nylon and make nylon stockings. We can make more money that way. So his realization in all this is that there was going to be way more money to be made in nylon, which ended up being the truth and ever could be made in dealing with fissile materials, that he and a lot of people that worked around him at DuPont rightly concluded that at no point in making any kind of nuclear anything, be it weapons or energy, uh, would it not be something that had to have a lot of government control and oversight, and that uh, any kind of fissile material would always be a state-controlled substance, that this was something that you could never just turn over to the civilian market and let them run which ended up being true. That's how it is now in the United States and, and around the world. It's all the regulatory agencies that are in place. You can't just give this to anybody because of how easy it is to take fissile materials and make weapons out of them. Uh, so this is an important thing to think about, you know, and an, an important way that uh, to, to understand how DuPont approached this problem, that you go from not wanting to be involved, you know, you start with nylon and, and the potential of this huge project and get pulled through a lot of things, not the least of which is one of the most significant uh, things to happen in the 20th century, getting into atomic weapons and nuclear energy, and realizing that in the end that the way that they were going to make money was with nylon. So uh, I hope that that uh, gives you a good sense of what DuPont did at the Manhattan Project, and I realize that I've skimmed over a lot of stuff and have not mentioned a lot of other important DuPont sites, a lot of other important things that happened with the company. 
Um, but I'm more than happy to talk about this later, you know, and I want to turn back for other talks to uh, get into the Savannah River site and get into uh, some of uh, people at Crawford Greenwald thinking about what to do with this stuff after the war, with atomic energy and nuclear weapons after the war. But today, the Savannah River site, or uh, the Hanford Engineer Works, rather. So we'll take a second, and if anybody's uh, got any questions, let me uh, roll through. Let's see, Philip Leach has the, uh, the question, do you know the half-life of the plutonium, and is it still in the Queen Mary's? The, uh, no, it's not in the Queen Mary's. Once everything got made, I'll, I'll answer that first. Once everything got made, all that stuff went out. Uh, so um, the plutonium itself ended up either in secure facilities or in nuclear weapons somewhere. And the half-life of plutonium is, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of around 58,000 years. It's some pretty awful stuff. Uh, a lot of the slurries that are in the ground have, uh, or, or in some of the holding tanks that are at that site, have uh, half-lifes of thousands, uh, like a, uh, from, from like 1,000 years up to over 10,000 years, which is part of the problem of storing and dealing with them. And this kind of gets to a, a larger problem of uh, how do you, you know, how do you deal with something like this even on a civilian market? So whenever you're done with uh, the nuclear fuel that goes into civilian reactors, you still have the same kind of problem of how do you store this stuff until it's safe enough to get rid of in some way. Um, but it's a problem that gets started in World War II and one that we have not adequately resolved. So um, there we are with that. Uh, Chris asks, um, how was the pay at Hanford? Any bonuses paid to attract workers? Yes, absolutely. That um, The pay rates uh, were as competitive as they could make them, that they uh, wanted to entice people to go to the middle of nowhere to work. So um, there you are, that uh, the pay rates uh, changed as the war went on. Um, that's something that uh, is listed in some of the plant histories, and I'm afraid you've, you've, you've reached a crack in my armor. I don't know them off the top of my head, but DuPont did make the pay rates uh, competitive. Uh, that way people would want to go there and, and work, and particularly for a lot of the, the folks who work directly with uh, the machinery that was used to make plutonium and a lot of the research scientists who were there. And uh, Sandy wrote in, uh, plutonium-239 has a half-life of 24,100 years. So thank you for that. I thought it was whatever reason I had 58,000 in my head, so I stand corrected. Thank you for the uh, the number, Sandy, on the half-life of uh, plutonium. So uh, we will wrap things up for today. If you've got any further questions, uh, feel free to type them into the uh, comment section. I will uh, come back to them uh, after the live stream is done, or you can uh, reach me through the Lucas R. Clausen Hagley Historian Facebook page or you're welcome to send in a question to our standard form at Hagley, which is askhagley at hagley.org. Please uh, to do check out our website, hagley.org, to uh, find out about uh, when we are going to be opening. Delaware will be going into phase one before long, so Hagley will be uh, thinking about that as well. Check for all updates on the Hagley website about uh, what our opening plans are and how you can get out for a lovely walk on the Brandywine. In the meantime, you're welcome to check out our digital archives, digital.hagley.org. We have a specific section, particularly on the Hanford Engineer work. So you can look at a lot of the materials I showed you today, even see the films that I showed you in the full length uh, from beginning to end in their glorious color to uh, check them out and see some of the resources that are available on the Hanford Engineering Works. Also, uh, check out Hagley's Facebook page to uh, get updates on our opening time frame and uh, other things that are going on. We're going to continue with our Hagley from Home initiative because we won't be able to fully open for a while, so look there for other programs and other things that are going on. So thank you all for joining me today. We will be back with you next Friday, 10 a.m., for another episode of Live with the Hagley Historian. Until then, everyone have a lovely week, and I will see you next Friday. Take care.